So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just talk through a few cases with uh, Davina. So what we do is we run a, uh, a um, MDT where we discuss the cases that we're going to operate on. So I thought we'd just do a, a small number of cases just to give us a bit of a chance to talk in some detail about some of them. So, so this is uh, a patient well known to us. Uh, we call him DJ actually. I don't think that's giving away any secrets. What you can see here is a series of um, audiograms stretching over a period of about seven years. I'm sure you're all familiar with the audiograms. You know, the loudness is on the vertical axis, the uh, frequency across the horizontal axis. Blue represents left and red represents right. So I'm just going to talk you through the history of this child. Uh, and we're going to show some uh, x-rays as we go along and also uh, one or two little clips. So this is a boy who came to see me aged seven in 2010 with a two-year history of a foul smelling discharge from his left ear. He'd previously had grommets. His hearing was normal but when you looked in his ear we thought he'd got a left attic cholesteatoma. Now interestingly his mother reported that both uh, on both sides of the family, uh, hang on a minute, there were uncles who'd had cholesteatoma. So here is the family tree of this. Can you see that? You see, if, so here is the uh, child and here are uncles on both sides of the family. So this looks a little bit like something running in the family. So the first thing that was done was a CT scan that I think Davina can perhaps get up for us. So we want the first CT scan. So the symptoms were on the left. So if I just scroll through the coronals, first of all, and we start from the outside in, we can see his external ear and we can see his external auditory canal. So the cartilaginous and bony portion, and they look black, so patent. And then we get to the tympanic membrane on this side. And we, so as Dr. Wilson said, you normally don't see a normal tympanic membrane, but we see it quite clearly on the axial in the coronal view and it's thickened and also it's retracted, it's pulled in. Uh, so that's not normal. And then when we go into the middle ear, we can see the hypotympum here, which is black and down here on the axial view. So that's fine. And majority of the mesotympanum is also black, including the sinus tympany. He's moved a little bit, so that's where it gets a bit blurry, because I think he wasn't very old at the time. And even though it doesn't take very long to do the scan, he's moved a bit. Um, but then when we get up to the top of the mesotympanum in the attic, you can see there's no longer black. It's a pacified with probably a abnormal soft tissue. And if we compare it this time with his normalish right ear, you can see the scutum here looks fairly pointy, whereas on this side, you can't really see it at all. So likely have been eroded. And then even though with the movement artifact, we've got the other side to compare with. And when you try and find the ice cream cone on this side, that's probably it here, but you, you can see it's not nice white bone like you can see on the other side. That's a nice ice cream cone on the right. Um, so the head of the malleus and the body in short process of the incus are barely seen. Um, but interestingly, the long process of the malleus, uh, the long process of the incus is just about hanging on, but it's probably uh, not in a great shape. And you can just about see the stapes and there's the handle of the malleus there. And one last thing on this side. Um, so you've got the mastoid air cells, which as uh, Paddy has said, you normally see the lovely fine network of bony uh, trabeculations within it. Whereas on this side, it's fairly bland looking. So, um, and they're completely pacified the mastoid air cells on this side. So radiologically, you'd be worried about a cholesteatoma with the erosion of the scutum and that it's extending, it's quite extensive. 
and then did a lot of the obstacles and into the master with bone. Okay. Uh, okay, I think there's a somebody's got their microphone on him somewhere or other. Yes. Can, can, can you hear me now? Yes. So that, that's great. Thanks, Davina. So, so we did the left closed cavity mastoidectomy. We removed a massive great cholesteatoma in the mastoid in the middle ear, uh, and we took the incus and the malleus head out. Now, the following year, we did a second look mastoidectomy, and this showed a small recurrent pearl of cholesteatoma in the attic, which was removed. The stapes was clear of disease, and the post-operative hearing gradually returned to normal. So we're just going to, can we go back to my screen? We can see a series of audiograms, the first audiogram, and by the time we've done a second look mastoidectomy and removed a cholesterol recurrence, we've got normal hearing. And notice that we've also got normal hearing on the right ear. So, as we do, the child just continued under regular review. But now, five years later, the child has developed a discharge from the right ear, and there was evidence of an attic pit. Now at this stage, some more radiology was done. So we're now five years after the first diagnosis of the left cholesteatoma, which had been treated by two mastoid operations. And I think Davina now has some more imaging to show us. So he's, so he's obviously had left-sided surgery. So we can see there's a defect in the come down onto the same thing on the axial there's a defect in the lateral uh, wall of the left mastoid bone and the mastoid cavity that's been left behind is a pacified now on ct it's difficult to know whether that's just granulation tissue or whether potentially that could represent recurrent cholesteatoma and obviously the majority of the ossicles as uh, mr princely has said has been have been removed there is a remnant the handle of the malleus still there but the majority of the ossicles have been removed and he's got that thickened tympanic membrane but I'm not sure if there was a graft but in there's a small defect as well so it may have a small perforation in there as well but the remainder of the middle ear looks okay on that side now the interesting thing about this scan is that in 2010, the right ear was completely, well, essentially normal. Maybe the tympanic membrane was a little bit thickened. So on the coronal image, uh, the external auditory canal is, is patent. However, this is the tympanic membrane here, which is slightly uh, retracted, but, and there's almost complete pacification of the middle ear now on that side with a small air pocket seen anteriorly and the scutum on that side is still there but maybe has some is subtly eroded on our imaging and the main change whereas in 2010 you could clearly identify the ice cream cone the head of the malleus and body in the process. it's now um is now definite of erosion and the long process is just about there and you can see this AP is just about there connecting to the oval window and the long and the head of um, the handle of the malleus is still there but the additus ad antrum is completely opacified and now the um, mastoid air cells are also completely opacified so you'd be suspicious that he's still quite an extensive cholesteatoma on the right side and potentially worried about recurrent cholesteatoma on the left. Good okay thanks Davina. You can see the bottom uh, left audiogram is the result of the right closed cavity mastoidectomy which we did because Davina was quite right there was a the large cholesteatoma which had appeared in the right ear over a period of five years. Now, what's interesting about this, of course, is that we follow these children up like a hawk. So this child had been seen every year, but despite the fact that we were looking at this child and checking the ears, there was nothing we could do to stop this large cholesteatoma appearing behind the opposite eardrum. So now what had been the better hearing ear 
becomes the worst here year because we've removed the incus and the malleus head, resulting in a significant conducting hearing loss. We then went on to reoperate on the left ear. This was now the third operation, which revealed a massive recurrence. Now I'm going to try and uh, show you what happened when we reoperated now on the left ear, third operation, left ear. So the ear is pushed forward, and this is the mastoid cavity previously created. And what you can see is this massive great cholesteatoma sac, which has appeared again in the first operated ear. And you can see uh, it being gently fished out of the mastoid with suckers and hooks and drills. Right. Fortunately, the um, result of the hearing on the left ear, which as we know was the first operated ear, has now gradually recovered. Presumably because the stapes bone is still present on that side. So this is a situation where we've got cholesteatoma developing pretty much in plain sight in the second ear. And the absolute crucial role of the radiology in determining what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. So that's just a, a sort of unhappy story of a child's ear. And remember, this is a child who comes from a family of people who have cholesteatoma. And we, we know more and more about this. We think there are genes in certain families which predispose to this condition, particularly bilateral disease and particularly disease occurring in children. So you may find that in your practice. So I'm just going to move on now to the next case. This is a case of a child uh, operated just last week. Uh, it's a 12-year-old operated by Abdul Mohammed, who's one of our brilliant team at the Norfolk and Norwich and James Paget Hospital. It's a child with global development delay, a child who has a history of a cleft palate repair. Now, remember, children who have a history of a cleft palate repair are children whose eustachian tubes don't work very well. And we know that there's a much increased incidence of middle ear disease and cholesteatoma in cleft palate children. But also, very interestingly, an increased incidence of cholesteatoma in the siblings of children who have cleft palate who don't themselves have cleft palate. So there's something very constitutional about the development of cholesteatoma in these children. So this patient who is, uh, has severe developmental delay and cannot have his hearing tested has a history of ear infections. Although the mother thought that the hearing was probably okay. So I'm going to just show you now the appearance of the right ear with an endoscope. And then I'm going to ask Davina to show us the CT scans. So we're looking down the ear and you can see there's a sort of odd soft tissue mass in the attic region. That, and I'm just going to show you the other ear. Um, this is now the left ear. Remember there are history of infections in both ears. This is the view of the left ear which we can see is grossly retracted, and we can see the promontory and really not much else in the way of features. So I don't know whether Davina can now flip over to show us the scans of this patient who is... Um... It's not quite straightened up. Um, so these are images from a different hospital and um, normally, uh, as you can see, he's slightly skew width, so... You're, you're not seeing both ears on the same uh, on the same side, but we'll start with the right ear. Um, the external auditory canal is patent. The hypotympanum and the mesotympanum are black and therefore patent, but there is a pacification of the the attic. It's difficult to really comment on the scutum, but it does appear slightly blunted um, and the opacification is sort of centered on the adductors ad antrum and the mastoid air cells but the underlying mastoid air cells don't look quite normal either 
this is quite a lot of thickened and sclerotic bone and from what you said he's had multiple previous ear infections and um, the mastoid air cells with multiple previous episodes of chronic mastoid can can become quite poorly aerated and very sclerotic and not infrequently we see that um, and particularly in this patient on that side and then when we look at the ossicles on this side you can make out the head of the malleus and the body in short process of the incus um, so they do appear to be present, but then when you, so you should really see two par parallel lines of the uh, long process of the incus and the handle of the malleus, but you don't really, you just about see the handle of the malleus there, but you don't see the long process of the incus. And I'm struggling to see the stapes on that side, but we can find that quite difficult sometimes. Um, so there's the oval window there. Um, there may be just the stapes just on it there, but it's it's a bit tricky. Um, and then, as you said, the the left his left ear also was not. Um, he was having troubles on the left as well, and so the external auditory canal and the middle ear look quite well aerated. The scutum again looks a little bit blunted, but that's difficult to assess. But when you look at his ossicles there's this gray area where there probably should be white, where there should be white at the um, head of the malleus and um, body and short process of the incus. Um, and there's the handle of the malleus, but you don't see a long process of the incus. So it looks like something's happened in this ear. Um, there was a cholesterol that formed and, and then just auto evacuated, I'm not sure. Um, one of the questions on the chat was about the horizontal bony facial canal and which plane was best to look at it. Um, I think both the axial and coronal. Um, so not, you can see the horizontal portion here just coming underneath the lateral semicircular canal. Um, so I would correlate with both the axial and, and coronal really. Um, the lateral wall's probably slightly better on the axial images. I don't know, Paddy, what, what do you think? It's quite difficult. When our cone beam CT comes in, that will make our lives easier. No, I agree. I, I'd always use both both planes. Um, I, th I, th I think both are mutually complementary. So yeah, absolutely. Because I think, I think we still struggle because we get we get down to 0 0.6 millimeter slices but it's such small anatomy um that we're still maybe sort of getting what we call um you know overlap between the slices and um it's difficult and one question from the chat mr princely was about uh, presumably about first look cholestetomas i think it was and whether you should, we should straight go straight for diffusion mri or whether we should do ct um I think we. Um, yeah. I, I find the uh, the new uh, uh, diffusion MRI is a fa fabulous tool, actually, and uh, I, I know a lot of people are now just uh, using that for diagnosis. But actually, for bony anatomy, I don't think you can do better than the CT. So it might actually be that in the patients that end up being operated, you might actually need to do both. I think. So I think we might we might end up with a situation where we're using the MRI for a diagnostic purposes but for surgical planning i can i don't think we're going to improve on ct and it sounds like the cone bean ct that's coming is going to give us even better certainly details around the obstacles so I, I don't think we're looking at i think i think we may we may find that we're doing more scans rather than less as you get better at it yeah, oh, yeah. Um, so shall i just take you through what happened with this case yeah. so here we are we're, we're now operating on the uh, right ear now, my question was, what sort of operation do I need to do on this child? I'm going to do a mastoid operation. Do I need to do a combined approach operation? Do I need to do an uh, open cavity with an in-out approach? Uh, I'm conscious that this is a very disabled child that's a difficult child to anaesthetize, and I'm going to have to probably operate on both ears. So, and taking into account the anatomical state of the mastoid, I decided that what we would try and do are small cavity mastoid operations. 
So here we are, we've done some surgery, we've made a posterior incision, we're widening the canal and beginning to expose the tissue around the cholesteatoma. You can see a fine diamond burr is being used and you can see that white tissue coming into view. Um, here, we see the ossicles are exposed. We can see the incus being mobilized. The incus long process is eroded. It wasn't touching the stapes. And we can see that the uh, malleus was also somewhat mobilized. Here we see a little piece of cotton wool being used with some adrenaline on to mobilize the cholesteatoma sac, which was lying medial to the ossicles. And here you see it being gently lifted away. I love to use these cotton wool balls, which are very atraumatic, to push this sac away. And you can see the limit of the sac was really quite limited. So it just lay pretty much just behind the or medial to the ossicular heads and did not extend far into the mastoid. So this is quite a limited attic cholesteatoma. And it is definitely the case that if we'd done one of these uh, non-diffusion MRI scans, we would have had a better idea of the extent of the cholesteatoma before we'd done the operation. And we'll just move on to the... Uh, and here we have, at the very end of the operation, Abdul is putting a small fascia graft into the cavity which has been created. And I anticipate that'll be an area which will dry up. I'm very much hopeful that we won't need to do any more surgery on that area but I think we will need to operate on the opposite here. So that would be my approach to a sort of awkward cholesteatoma in an awkward patient who has it in both ears. And I think that uh, although there's obviously a great favor given to trying to close, do closed cavity mastoidectomies, and it is what I try and do myself, as you can see from the first case, I think in this particular case, taking into account that the actual patient, I think this was much the best thing to do.